Good evening. I'd like to call our regular board meeting to order. Uh, I'm going to ask the treasurer to call the roll for us. President Baker. Present. Mr. Brown. Here. Vice President Cole. Present. Ms. Gibbs. Ms. Hudson. Here. Mr. Peretti. Ms. Reyes. You have four members present, so you have a quorum, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. And I'd like to ask um, Treasurer-elect Kilgore to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, if she doesn't mind. I think she's here somewhere. Come on up to the podium. I didn't, I didn't give her any advance notice. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you, Treasurer Elect. We look forward to continuing to work with you just in a new capacity. Well, welcome, everyone. Happy holidays. Um, hope you are all enjoying the season. And um, We'll get right down to business. I'll read through briefly the agenda so we all know what we have in front of us this evening. After we adopt our agenda, we'll take public comment if anyone has signed up to address the board, which no one has as of right now. We'll then hear from our direct reports. We will then consider our consent agenda. Uh, the board will recess into executive session at the end of the meeting. and. Um, that's about it for this evening. So having said that, I'll now entertain a motion that we adopt the agenda. So with, moved. With one minor change, as I recall. Mr. Treasurer. If um, please the board, I'd like to substitute, uh, I believe it's for agenda item 15.7, uh, uh, a resolution that I placed at your um, seats this evening. The resolution that was on the agenda had to do with the carry forward of our uh, qualified school construction bond um, allocation. Um, I will explain during my comments later in the meeting what is going on, but we're substituting in a resolution authorizing the issuance of those bonds um, and just authorizing it. But again, I'll explain that later. But if we could substitute that resolution for this resolution, I would greatly appreciate it. We'll keep it in there as item 15.7. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. So I do believe we have a motion to adopt the agenda with the substitution from the vice president. Second. Moved and seconded. Hearing no further discussion, Mr. Treasurer, please call the roll. President Baker? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Vice President Cole? Yes. Ms. Hudson? Yes. That motion carried. Thank you very much. Um, as there is no one signed up to address the board this evening, we'll move right into our direct report reports and uh, call on our superintendent. The floor is yours. Thank you, President Baker, Vice President, Cole, members of the board. A week ago of us, many of us, a week ago, as many of us in this room gathered for the two special Story of Success events at Fort Hayes, the programs both began with a very powerful message. It said, every day and in every corner of Columbus City Schools, a story of success is being written. It's being written by some of the more than 51,000 children actively learning in our more than 3,000 classrooms or it's being crafted by some of our more than 8,000 teachers, staff, and administrators who are eager to share their positive, empowering energy with all our students, our families, each other, and the community we so proudly serve. From my first meeting with this Board of Education more than 50 months ago to my last one this evening, the stories of success in Columbus schools have been constant. One of the threads stretching through each of those stories is the notion that success is never simply given, it is earned. And when something like success is earned through hard work, commitment, and steadfast dedication, it deserves to be recognized. I could spend hours trying to capture all of the stories of success in our district over the past four and a half years, and I would still miss so many. Our communications team has tried to encapsulate as many of those stories in one document, which I hope everyone will take a moment to look through. These copies are available here tonight. They're also on our website and on the Columbus City Schools mobile app. In this one book, we try to spotlight the achievements and accomplishments earned by our students and staff, the families who've been better served in every neighborhood, the social, emotional, and health needs of our children that we are now able to address, and the partnerships we've built with the private and nonprofit businesses and organizations, churches and charities, elected leaders, and caring, concerned individuals across our communities. These are the stories of success that have been well-earned and will have far-lasting implications. Those who helped write those stories deserve the recognition. 
Also tonight, I want to honor the hard work of our literacy teams and our third grade readers as they too have earned well-deserved recognition. We learned this week that more than 61% of our current third graders have already met or exceeded the requirements of the state's third grade rating guarantee for this next year. That's an incredible seven percentage points ahead of where we were at the same time last year and puts us on a path to exceeding our end of, number, end of year numbers from last school year. Those young people and their teachers have earned those scores and they deserve a round of applause as well. <laughs> Moving from elementary to graduation, I also wanna applaud the 53 students who earned their diplomas last night in what I believe is this district's first ever mid-year commencement ceremony. You talk about hard work and dedication. These students, some of them adults, never gave up, never dropped out. They stayed in our programs, many of them earning their diplomas by showing how they are career ready through the work keys assessments. When I visited their class several weeks ago, I asked, what can I do to honor what you have earned? And they said, we want a real graduation. And so we gave them a real graduation. Thank you, Board Member Gibbs, for delivering an empowering message to our newest graduates of Columbus City Schools and to President Baker for presiding over the ceremonies. In three days, all of our students will begin their winter break with the last day of classes, this Friday. They've earned this time away, but a break in classes does not mean a pause in our stories of success. I want to encourage our students and families to take time in between family gatherings and celebrations to keep reading to visit our website and the social media pages for special CCS Reads activities, and to log on to the Schools Out section of the City of Columbus's Recreation and Parks website to find free and discounted tickets to events all across town. It's designed to keep our students safe and engaged over the winter break. And I thank Director Rhonda Johnson, the Education Director of this city, for helping to make that happen. Finally tonight, I want to share my personal appreciation for all who have taken a moment this past month to stop by and share their own thoughts and memories on this journey we've taken together over the past 55 months. Today, we had a brief photo op out at our Columbus Afrocentric Early College campus to celebrate the work completed so far on the Nubian Pyramid metal structure, all work done by our students and our volunteer partners in the construction trades unions. It was an honor to stand with my friend, my brother, he calls me, Charles Tennant, who has truly earned the respect of so many. Thank you, Charles, and your family. I will not forget the student performers at last week's show, who every one of them earned a standing ovation. I'm so proud of our student ambassadors who proudly spoke in representation of the student body and our culinary arts students whose work was well appreciated by all of our guests. Thank you to the teachers, staff, and administrators all who devoted a lot of work and energy to making these events last week special to me, to our partners, and to the guests. And thank you to this board for allowing us to keep the focus on students and on the district's successes, not on me, and for truly honoring the spirit of success in our district. So much has been earned by so many in this district, and it's a shame that far too often those successes go unnoticed by the media and the community. But I know the right people are in the right place to continue writing this story of success. Most of all, I am proud yet humbled at the empowerment and spirit of success that's been instilled in our community. And I know that will last far beyond today, far beyond my time, and I appreciate you for that opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Are there any questions or comments from board members on the superintendent's report? Later. Later. Thank you, Yes, thank you for your report. Um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll share some more personal comments later on. Um, let's move on then, if there are no questions, to the internal auditor. Madam internal auditor, have you anything to share with the board this evening? Thank you, President Baker. Um, I don't have a formal report, but I do see that there is a pamphlet at my seat uh, regarding internal auditing in Great City Schools. So if you would indulge me, I would like to just take a few minutes to talk about this pamphlet and how it came about. Um, does have a copy of this at their table. 
Okay, great. Uh, the Council of Great City Schools, probably around two years ago, asked the internal auditors to draft a white paper regarding uh, what it is an internal audit does, the value that we bring to school districts, um, and some of the things that we do and that we don't do, and some of the key components and processes necessary to have a, um, a pretty good internal audit function. So I was part of the panel that worked on drafting this document. And I am happy to say, if you look through some of the um, best practice processes that they recommend, we have all of them in place here in Columbus City Schools. So this is a pamphlet that is designed to, if you're out and about and someone asks, well, what does your internal audit function do? Instead of going into a long dialogue or calling me up. <laughs> you can always just hand them this pamphlet. It's high enough at a high level um, to give them a good overview. And if they had more questions, they could reach out to anyone in the, that contributed to the, uh, the pamphlet for more information. And we'd be more than happy to sell the value of internal audit. So that was one thing that um, we discussed at ANA this, this past Thursday. I'm sorry, this past Monday, losing track of time. Um, also at a and while we didn't have a quorum, we did have a good discussion about the committee's charter. So they gave me some very positive feedback. I'll take that information, put it into a revised draft, and hopefully have a final product to bring to this board for um, a final recommendation at the probably the February meeting if the committee you know, reviews the changes and agrees to adopt those changes and recommend that this is a charter that they would like to work under. Uh, to the best of my uh, knowledge, that uh, wraps up what I would like to share with the board. Thank you, Madam Internal Auditor. And uh, as usual, you are far too uh, modest. So this fall, earlier this year, when the Council of Great City Schools Board of Directors, on which I'm pleased to sit as a member of this board, uh, agreed to release this report, um, I brought back a copy for everyone, and our internal auditor was a member of the committee that put this together. What's important is, as you read through this document, you see that our Office of Internal Audit um, really portrays all of the very best characteristics of an Office of Internal Audit. So under your leadership, we have developed and built a world-class internal audit shop, and so we thank you for that. Thank you very much. All right, does that conclude your report? Yes, it does. All right, any other questions or comments for the internal auditor? Thank you. Yes, well done, thank you. All right, now, Mr. Treasurer. Yes, On sir. to you, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Baker, Vice President Cole, members of the board this evening. Uh, we have a presentation uh, on the financial reports for the month ending November. Uh, beginning with total revenues um, right there. Um, beginning with total revenues and expenditures. Revenues are again this month uh, running uh, above plan year to date and expenditures are under plan year to date. Uh, for the month, total revenues came in about 2.7 million below plan, um, decreasing the year to date favorable variance to about 18 and a half million over plan. That's within 5% of our uh, projections this, this year to date. Total expenditures for the month uh, ran under plan by about three and a half million, and that brought the year-to-date variance to uh, 16 million under plan so far. Any cash balance is therefore about 34 million over our plan, and it stands at 224 million for the end of the month. When we look at the individual revenue line items, um, the ones that we, we noted, first of all, was uh, state aid. It came in about 3.8 million under plan for the month, but as you might recall, last month because of the new data being uh, used for this fiscal year, uh, like enrollment, current enrollment numbers, as well as the implementation of various provisions from the recent, uh, recently approved uh, biennial budget for the state, uh, we had a little catch-up payment, payment last month, so we had a, a blip up that month. It's leveled itself out this month, and we expect that um, we'll, we'll pretty much see level revenue uh, month to month here on out. Uh, but for the year, state aid is about 1.9 plan, just barely 1% um, over plan, so it's very much on target. We looked at um, 
the restricted federal grants, a much smaller line item here, uh, but we just uh, received, a, and interestingly enough, because my later comments are going to be about qualified school construction bonds, we received our first subsidy uh, payment uh, in this past month in November. The plan had called for it to come in January, so that's simply a timing issue thus far. Uh, the property tax allocation. Um, we did receive uh, about $3.1 in tangible personal property reimbursement from the state, uh, and that brought our year-to-date plan uh, within 1% of, or our year-to-date receipts within 1% of the plan. We're running about 218000 over plan on a $20 million estimate thus far, so we're very, very close there. Um, all other revenues um, came in about, uh, they're within about $3 million. Um, uh, year to date uh, over plan uh, versus about 2.6. Uh, that has to do with the receipt of some uh, payment in lieu of taxes uh, this past month that were a little bit higher. In fact, this is the second highest payment that we received this year. And those, again, hard to predict, but they and they do vary month to month. But we are we are pretty much right on plan there. Um, I think that does it for revenue side. When we move over to expenditures. Personnel um, jumped to about uh, 10 million under plan um, from 7.8 million under plan last month. As I've noted before, we're still implementing uh, the changes due to the recently approved collective bargaining agreements. We should get that all implemented here in December. Uh, by the end of December, we'll have a much better picture where we are um, year to date given those, those new agreements. Um, December is going to be, is a three pay month, so you'll see a little spike in those expenditures, but we planned for that. We looked to purchase services um, year to date. Um, they came in under plan um, by about 3.3 million, and they um, are running um, under plan um, you know, year to date. Charter uh, STEM scholarship line, though, is very much on target. Uh, that's, um, uh, and we are running within what the state says that we should see for the, for the balance of the year. So um, I think that line is working itself out you know, very well. The purchase services side uh, is going to get a little more examination because it is running under plan, as we did with supply and material. Uh, supply and materials, although they ran over plan for the month, they're still under plan by about $2 million. Uh, the same categories contribute to that, and we're watching that on a budgetary basis as well. Although the, the expenditures aren't as rapid as we anticipated, they are fully, you know, pretty much fully encumbered. Uh, so it's it's pretty much a timing issue uh, in that category. We expect that to work itself out during the year. Uh, we did find interesting in capital outlay that it um, it has jumped this past month. And quite frankly, year to date has exceeded what we had in the plan uh, for the entire year. Uh, we had projected about two million to be expended, and we're we're at two million expended year to date at this point. So we looked at it on a budgetary basis and noticed that there have been some, um, not subject to board approval, but there have been some budgetary um, transfers and some movement there. So we're going to go back and look to see if that came out of purchase services and supplies and can contributed to, to that being uh, those line items being under plan. But right now the gross total exposure here is about $4 million, a little over $4 million. So it's just due to those budgetary transfers having been made. So we'll get a better explanation to see what uh, the various departments have moved dollars from into this, this line item. Um, other than that, the other line items for uh, expenditures have remained unchanged for the month. And in general, um, we continue with revenues over plan and expenditures under plan. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Are there any questions from board members for the Treasurer on his report? Thank you. Carry on. Out of my second item. Um, <coughs> Early in the meeting, I asked you to uh, substitute some legislation in on the agenda to authorize the issuance of, um, I think it's $29,401,000 in qualified school construction bonds. Um, they are affectionately known as Q-Scoobies. 
Uh, so I, I, will, I will use that because it's just shorter and I'm used to calling them that. Um, <clears throat> QSCOOBIES are um, bonds that carry with them a federal subsidy um, for interest expense. And so they end up being uh, zero or near zero uh, financing for construction projects. We utilized this before, back in, I believe, 2010, uh, to finance uh, the renovation at uh, Stewart and the purchase of the Manicor building. Uh, we have not subsequently used that allocation. Uh, I think primarily because since then we've been doing mostly refundings, that is refunding existing debt in a lower interest rate environment. Uh, these have to be, this, these types of bonds must be used to finance new renovations, new constructions. They may not be used for the purchase of buses. I'll just put that on the table right now as we contemplate uh, that in the future as well, but they can be used for that. We have been holding on to this allocation, uh, quite frankly, uh, to get the best bang for the buck. In January, when we issued a portion, 75 million, of the 125 million that was approved last November, um, we looked at the Q Scoobies, but felt in a rising interest rate environment that we'd wait until that federal subsidy would be, in fact, worth more, and that the next time we issue bonds, the remaining uh, 50 million, that it would be uh, a bifurcated <coughs> bond issue, part Q Scoobies and part tax exempt. Qualified school construction bonds are issued on a taxable basis so they carry a higher interest rate, um, but with the subsidy, it makes them more cost effective than a like amount of tax exempt financing. Here recently, and why this legislation is before you tonight, is that as you all know, uh, Congress is considering, as we speak, a pretty major overhaul to the uh, federal tax code. Part of that tax code, um, and we followed this, Eric Roush and I followed what impacted K-12 education and an eye on what impacted finance. And our primary focus during all of the discussions was on SALT, the state and local tax deductibility and the impact it would have on the receptiveness to um, increases in local taxes and, and things like that. Uh, so we were paying attention to that because that was really the hot topic. Um, apparently um, in one version, I think it was the House version, is Eric here? In the House version, uh, the elimination of the QSCOOBY program uh, was included. In the Senate version, it was not, and it didn't rise to get our attention very much. Um, now, as we understand it in the bill before them, they are going to, effective 1231 of this year, eliminate this program. And therefore, if we do not exercise our right to issue these bonds within the next week, we will lose the ability to take advantage of that near zero financing. So the legislation before you tonight is to authorize the issuance. We over the next two days, because this is fast tracked, over the next two days we'll be working with our facilities people, our bond council who is here tonight, uh, Dinsmore and Scholl, and our municipal advisor, Zumba, who was also here tonight, if you have any questions. We'll be working with them as a team to analyze the cost effectiveness of using these, these, uh, this type of financing, uh, to identify projects that we would allocate to this financing, uh, and decide whether or not we, we choose to uh, proceed with all of it, all 29, uh, 401 million, um, or um, to do a portion, or to do not, nothing at all. But that authority you're going to grant to, to me to exercise, I will keep you apprised of that as our analysis uh, continues. Uh, we have been on conversation. Um, I got a phone call last night at like 6 o'clock, and we talked for an hour or so. Um, I sent you all a memo about this uh, late last night. And beginning bright and early this morning, we were in conversation again. and. All during today, there were several other developments that came up to certain aspects that we are considering. So we've been reviewing this um, in oh so many ways uh, to make sure that this makes sense for us. The legislation tonight uh, simply keeps the door open to us exercising our right to this type of financing. And as I said, in the next two days, you'll hear from me as we progress, but in the next two days, we'll reach a decision as to whether or not we want to proceed. So if you have any questions about that or any of the other details, either I or our bond counselor, or municipal advisors can certainly address that. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. And I want to thank you for bringing this to our attention and making sure that you're on top of this and advising us as soon as you knew and the meeting that you hosted earlier today to try to 
brief some of us uh, on the issue. Mr. Brown, I think you had a question. Yeah, um, and, and I too want to thank you and, and, and Eric Rausch uh, you know, for being so on top of this. Um, it's hard. I, I suspect most members of Congress don't yet have a clue what they voted on, uh, but to be able to identify this and, uh, and be able to act so quickly uh, is, is clearly to uh, the benefit of, of Columbus City Schools and uh, our community. Uh, do you have uh, even a, a ballpark on uh, how much this may save us, uh, how much this potentially could save us if, uh, if we were to go this route? If we were to do uh, all $29,401,000 worth of the bonds, so we would do all of that on a net present value, you're looking at somewhere around 8 to $9 million um, in savings on the financing cost. Uh, there will be, it will be somewhat offset um, by increased um, construction costs because these projects must be done under prevailing wage. But as far as our analysis, and this is part of what we're going to continue to do over the next two days, our analysis uh, right now is that the increase in construction cost pales by comparison to the interest savings on the financing. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Peretti. Thank you, Treasurer Bohorek. I really appreciate you keeping on top of this and bringing this before us. And this will affect, um, you know, public education across the country, essentially. Um, and it's more just a comment. Um, again, you know, it's just one of those other elements that you see, whether it's the federal or state government taking action, foolishly, I would say. And quite frankly, you know, for a party that claims to be about small government, they sure have no problem passing the buck along to the local government. So thank you very much for keeping on top of this. I appreciate it. Any other questions or comments for the Treasurer? Anything else from you, Mr. Treasurer? Um, just that as much as we're on top of it, the phone call came from our municipal advisors last night who had been studying it on our behalf, doing their job. Um, and it was, it was really they who, who triggered uh, this action. So um, kudos to them, just so you know. Thank you very much, Ed. Marvin here in the front row, and Ed's on the far right-hand side uh, with Dinsmore, our bond council. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer, for making sure the right people are at the table so that they can keep you informed and you can keep us informed. If there's nothing else from or for the Treasurer. That concludes my report tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's now take up our consent agenda. So the Chair will entertain a motion that we approve the consent agenda as it's been presented. I move that we approve the consent agenda. Moved and Second. seconded. Uh, questions, comments on any piece of legislation contained within the consent agenda this evening, colleagues? Mr. Brown? No, just uh, two very briefly on 15.1, which is a gift of books. I uh, just want to make sure that we recognize and thank uh, Barry Fromm for uh, all those books uh, for Columbus Afrocentric Early College. Uh, it's a nice uh, donation. Barry happens to be a longtime personal friend, and uh, I wasn't aware of this until uh, it was put on our agenda, but uh, I, I've got pretty good awareness of uh, how uh, he came by the books, and uh, it's a nice thing for him to think of us and, and to do. Secondly, I uh, wanted to speak to 9.1, which uh, is uh, pertaining to a professional conference, uh, I guess four school board members want to travel to San Antonio in April for a National School Board Association conference at a cost in excess of $11,000. Um, for many of the reasons that I've stated in the past, um, I, I don't think that's a wise expenditure, and I would urge the board to uh, not approve that item. Uh, I will be voting against it. I also, uh, especially uh, given our financial situation, um, think that uh, right now is, is clearly not the time for this kind of uh, expenditure. Uh, we're going to be working very hard to uh, uh, bring down costs. Uh, 
across the board, uh, given you know what the what the state has done to us and what we anticipate from the federal government as well. Uh, there's lots of things that we'd like to do, and um, I just don't know that this is uh, a wise thing, especially for uh, for board members um, to do this uh, travel. So, uh, you know, those are my thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Any other comments or questions? Board Member Hudson. Oh, thank you, President Baker. On, um, it's a comment 14.1 through 14.4, <clears throat> no issue with the substance. And I think it's fantastic. We're um, really moving forward on multiple facilities with Operation Fix It. Um, I just I want to comment and thank uh, um, uh, Chair um, Peretti, along with their treasurer and uh, um, Maurice Oldham and team, uh, for the the start of putting uh, capital financial disclosures together for the finance committee. Um, we have a ways to go. We have a lot to do, but the information and the data um, provided just demonstrated. Um, heroic efforts, uh, but also I think very important efforts to bring transparency and accountability to the community um, on the from that financial level uh, to um, to Operation Fix It, but also to all of our facilities and hopefully. And I think what we were seeing already was um, really some rich um, planning information. This was information, it was a vision of a former community member who served uh, on uh, FAC with us and, and had experience with real estate. And I think it, it demonstrates having those, having that experience, uh, uh, community um, expertise at the table with us really makes a difference. So thank you for your efforts and we'll look forward to continuing um, on uh, uh, work on this work. Thank you, board member Hudson. Any other questions or comments from board members? All right, seeing none, Mr. Treasurer, please call the roll. Mr. Brown. Yes, except as to item 9.1, and I vote no on that. Vice President Cole. Uh, yes, with a no on 9.2. Ms. Gibbs? Yes. Ms. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Peretti? Yes. President Baker? Yes the consent agenda passes. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Uh, now I would like to call on Board Member Gibbs to report on uh, recent conference attendance by board members. Board Member Gibbs, the floor is yours. Have a clicker. Well, good evening as they assemble all of the um, required devices. Um, <laughs> President Baker, Vice President Cole, colleagues on the board, um, our board member Ramona Reyes, not feeling well, but I'm sure watching us on Facebook. Um, we want to thank you um, for the opportunity to discuss and to provide an update to you on our 2017 fall conference summaries. Um, we are a part of three major organizations as board members, and there's many more during our association, but as board members, we are a part of the Council of Urban Boards of Education through the National School Board Association, the Council of Great City Schools, and the Ohio School Board Association. This beautiful picture is from last night, from our very first winter graduation. It was a young lady in, our, um, in East High School who was excited who had the opportunity through some innovative programs, some great thinking from our superintendent, um, a little pushing from Miss Peggy Cleary, and a whole lot of teamwork, was able to realize what we work for every day, and is that is ensuring that each student is highly educated, prepared for leadership and service, and empowered for success as citizens in the global community. Um, she did not get to graduate with her class, but last night, 53 of our students, I'm sure of you shared, um, was able to complete their high school career. And all of the work that we do in our professional development 
and when we go to conferences and training are to find more ways, things that we may be doing and things that we may do better to help students reach that point that you see right there, pure elation, surrounded by her village, supported by a team, you don't see her teachers and her principals who are right outside the frame, who are helping our students actually um, get to this milestone. So we're not just um, measuring, you know, just the milestones and moving a ticker. We want to get to this moment and making sure people are moving forward in life. And so um, President Baker, um, Vice President Cole and I are going to discuss the three conferences that we were able to attend this year. And we are going to start with the Council of Great City Schools and the Council of Urban Boards of Education. And President um, Baker, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Board Member Gibbs. CUBE annual conference was in New Orleans in September. Uh, the Council of Urban Boards of Education <coughs> supports urban school boards, fosters effective school district leadership, and addresses the educational challenges that exist in our nation's urban centers. As part of its mission, CUBE creates educational opportunities for urban school board leaders to gain the knowledge and skills necessary to serve as effective local education policymakers and as advocates for excellence and equity in public education. The NSBA board established CUBE in 1967. This year commemorated 50 years of service with more than 100 member districts. CUBE is committed to helping school boards to close the student achievement gap and provide all students an equal opportunity to receive a high quality education with a specific focus on meeting the needs of our nation's historically underrepresented and underserved students. We had the opportunity to visit schools and other facilities of the St. Charles Parish School District. Their district has about 10,000 students in 15 schools, nine elementary, four middle, two high school. One of their points of pride was a former Kmart building that they were able to renovate into a district training center, data center, and warehouse. It was very interesting to see what they had done there. We attended sessions discussing such topics as budgeting, charters, equity, governance, and how to write an equity policy for your district. Speakers included John King Jr. from the Education Trust, Jamie Almanzan and Greg Meyer from the Equity Collaborative, and writer Clint Smith. I brought back conference programs for each board member. You have those before you this evening. The opportunity to interact with board members from other urban districts from around the country is invaluable. And attendance at specifically the CUBE conferences has, I'm speaking for myself, made me a better board member. And I appreciate the opportunity to attend and to learn from colleagues from around the country. Thank you, Ms. Gibbs. Mr. Vice President. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Council of Great City Schools 61st Annual uh, Fall Conference took place uh, this past October in Cleveland, Ohio, just up the road, 71 North. Um, we had the very unique experience of um, having the opportunity to work directly with an organization, national organization, responsible for representing the needs specifically of urban public school districts. Compro composed of, or comprised, if you will, of 68 large city school districts, its mission is to promote the cause of urban schools and to advocate for inner city school students through legislation, research, and media relations. The organization also provides a network for school districts sharing common problems to exchange information and to collectively address new challenges as they emerge in order to deliver the best possible education to urban youth. And I'll refer to this district, this, this, this information here, this data that was compiled by uh, the Council of Great City Schools um, very recently this year um, that even has some of our data in it. One of the things I'm very proud to say that I learned about Columbus City Schools and the great work we've done uh, on a national level, we were acknowledged for students and their mathematic achievement in high school getting a better, degree, uh, a better concentration of mathematic curriculum and study and showing that they are actually performing 
uh, at a higher level nationally. Um, data right here in this book. And they did a wonderful job not only compiling this data uh, throughout the country and throughout the membership or districts, but also doing it in a way that was unbiased, doing it and approaching this in a very methodical, um, kind of empirical way. Um, I was very impressed by the work. I continue to be very impressed by uh, our relationship with them and what comes of it. Uh, as our board president said, it makes me a much more conscious, aware, um, and, and thoughtful uh, board member in my role here locally. Um, the total number of students served by the council member district schools is 7.3 million students. Um, the enrollment characteristics are 40% Latino or Hispanic, 29% African American, 20% white, 8% Asian Pacific Islander, 17% English language learners. Um, sounds familiar for our district, doesn't it? 70% uh, eligible free and reduced lunch students and students with individualized or IEPs at 14%, Alaskan Native American 1%. Um, just for your information, school districts eligible for membership must be located in cities with a population of over 250,000 and students enrolled over 35,000. So these are some of the largest school districts in the country, from Columbus City Schools to Miami-Dade. Um, The wellspring of accomplishments and innovations rising from our inner cities testify to the resounding benefits of investment in the nation's urban centers and in their public schools. Columbus City Schools is a member, and our President Baker uh, and all of us, well, certainly our President Baker announced that he serves on their board of directors. Um, our own superintendent also participated as a moderator for a session, something to talk about how great city schools are amplifying the student voice. Our leadership team also presented during the Rebel Rebel, uh, engaging students in reducing su suspensions in urban schools. Here, another opportunity for us to share best practices for our work. I'll again share the work that we shared with C C Council of Great City Schools um, in the conversation about internal audit and our focus, our very strong focus on risk management in the district. Um, that have helped pave the way for, again, this document that was produced by that organization. This is our leadership. Atlanta is not doing better than we are with internal audit. There's some other school district nationally that aren't doing better than we are with internal audit, just to name another example. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to have participated and, and look forward to our continued membership. Uh, I pass it on to Ms. Board Member Gibbs. Thank you, Vice President Cole. Um, our, our final conference of the year was the Ohio School Board Association. They held their held the Capitol Conference here in Columbus, Ohio, November 12th through the 14th. OSBA leads the way in uh, educational excellence by serving Ohio public school board members in the diverse districts they represent through superior service, unwavering advocacy, and creative solutions. OSBA began in 1955 after five regional associations banded together, and today they compose of 714 school boards. There are 3,466 <clears throat> elected board members represents Ohio's local city, exempted village, career center, and educational service center districts. This year's conference was held. It was a brand new format. It was shortened to two and a half days of intensive learning opportunities. Columbus City Schools was represented during the spotlight session, transforming public education. After viewing the movie, Most Likely to Succeed, our own Cherie Wells, Director of Secondary Instruction, myself and two superintendents from uh, Yellow Springs and Winton Woods uh, were discussing our innovative approaches to high school, their program, and their design. We were joined by President Baker and our Deputy Superintendent, Dr. John Stanford. We also um, was able to serve as the moderator for the Ohio Black Caucus Dinner, where they celebrated, again, years of work and service. I'm very proud to represent Columbus City Schools on the board of OSBA. During our meetings, we went through extensive, extensive review of the legislation be before uh, the Ohio House of Representatives 
and it is something. And so without the advocacy of OSBA, I can only think of where we would be um, educationally. <laughs> I can only think. And this was our incredible speaker. Her name was Madison Reed, and she's 11 years old from Cleveland Municipal School District. I don't know if you could get it to play. Nope, oh, she might not play. All of these things bring us to a, um, a point. So after we have been through these three conferences, and oh, I'm sorry, OSBA, the sessions we attended included sports culture from the Inside Out Foundation, understanding how our coaches are treating our children and the values that they are sharing and espousing with our young people. We also had, um, we talked about essential policies and the urban preschool expansion in three other school districts. Josh Radner, um, who was on the show, How I Met Your Mother, he was the last keynote speaker and he is a Bexley High School graduate. Didn't know that, but he did serve as our keynote speaker and we definitely were, enjoyed him. So it was an amazing conference. But of all three of them, the themes that we heard after we discussed it and um, in between sessions, we were able to debrief with some of our members of our team. The three things that resonated with us were these. Um, okay. I don't think my clicky's working. Oh, the first one. Eliminating suspensions for students in grades pre-K three. Discussed at all three conferences. It is um, not just conversations, it is a move that many of the urban school districts and other um, districts across the country are moving to. It is something we'd have to study, we something we have to look at what are those implementations and what other strategies would be used if we did not suspend students in pre-K-3, but it is a growing problem, especially in urban districts. Number two, um, we heard in a session there are districts that pick up the costs of the cap, gown, and diplomas for all seniors. Seniors must pay the rest of their student fees, but the price of your cap, gown, and diploma is picked up by the district through business partnerships and people who are absolutely excited to get students to graduate. They don't want costs to be a barrier, therefore they provide all the caps, grounds, and diplomas, and each school still has the autonomy to set senior breakfast, senior lunch, t-shirt, and those type of ideas, but finances should not be a barrier for the materials you need to participate in graduation. Next, we heard that we need to develop a specific equity policy unique to the Columbus Board of Education. Board Member Brown, that is something that will be coming to the Policy Review Committee. Um, the entire workshop consisted of people um, from Seattle, from Rhode Island, who wrote an equity policy to better guide the work in not just training, but in hiring all of our staff, everyone from HR to bus drivers, to teachers, to the people, it, I mean, every single person in the district um, needs to have a strong policy if we're gonna implement that work. It is um, still developing in some areas, but there are some districts who are very far along in that work. Um, implementing equity and restorative practices training for all new teachers and all staff. Again, we heard it through all three conferences. Um, restorative practices, and we're not going to report on our visit to Pittsburgh in this session, but we went and did a full day study of Pittsburgh and how they're implementing restorative practice, which is different than restorative justice. Restorative practices are the preventive measures before you get in the trouble, it's a, a pretty, it's a lot of de-escalation is what we saw on our visit and we'll report that under a different cover. But all three conferences touched on a restorative practices and how you bring people on board with the understanding of whatever your board and whatever your district value is of those practices and how you agree to implement it with all three. It's not just board, it's board, it's all of your labor, it's all of your administration. Everyone has to be on board on the value of that to avoid push out and to disrupt the school to prison pipeline. <clears throat> Reexamining our data and our evidence collection for life work skills. During the Council of Great City Schools and the uh, presentation by Miriam Driver, who's the superintendent of Milwaukee, she was discussing the challenges they have in their district. And one of their challenges, 
interesting enough was preparing kids for life and work skills. So we study math, we study science, we know academically, but when we talk about the life and work skills, it's different to your community. Um, and what they found is they measured the number of students that had driver's license because they don't have a walkable community in their public trans transportation isn't where it should be. And in one of their initiatives, they paid for kids to get driver's license. I am not proposing that. However, you go to conferences to hear different ideas of what they're measuring. And if they're measuring that, it just made us think, what else could we measure? What else could we look at to determine work readiness, life skill readiness, and being able to navigate? If Parents said, I'm not taking you one more place. Do our children know how to use the Dakota bus? Do they know how to use Uber? Do they know how to use Lyft? Do they know how to navigate the city without being reliant on parents? Because as adults, that is what they'll be called on to be. So it's just an idea of different, um, different ideas for that. Uh, using technology to help parents find schools, preschools, and enrollment. Using geo mapping. There are school districts that you can pick up your phone and say, okay, I'm starting a new job and I'll be working in Grandview. You can hit your app and they'll tell you all the preschool sites that are close to your job. So if you want to go to a new, if you want to move your child to a preschool close to your job, you can just find it right there. So geo mapping is a technology idea we can explore we may have, but something that other districts are using to help when you're looking for a new apartment and helping our families who may be experiencing a lot of homelessness or transition. If they find a place, they can hit it. Okay, I'm in a school district. This is the school that's in my area, and it takes probably hours off of central enrollment when you know where you're going and they have a good grasp of the schools that are in their area. It's really user friendly. <clears throat> and finally, Oh, not finally. The attendance and truancy campaign using existing staff. In, I believe it's Cleveland, they use um, staff to help in their attendance and truancy campaign. So if you were to have a staff member, maybe someone who is not in the classroom at that time, or is um, instead of going to the warehouse, their job is to report to the attendance office and to get a list of the students that are truant that day, and they make personal calls every day to the students that are not in school. Whether they are not in a classroom, however they use existing staff, they do a calling campaign to each student that is missing school that day. If they don't report by 9 a.m., they get a personal call every day. Interesting concept, interesting concept. But we know with the new laws around truancy and the state legislation that is coming down, parents, will, you will not be able to slide. They're, the state is not playing. And so reducing truancy is on the mind of every school district. And finally, again, to <clears throat> some of our visits, metal detectors in middle and high schools. We are one of the few major urban districts that don't need it. And that is a very um, big credit to our school culture, to our leadership, our safety and security, our building leadership. We have not had a major push to have metal detectors in middle and high school, but we did visit a district where they have it in the elementary school. And there's a lot of districts nationwide that have them. And so we have not even visited that as a policy or a question for implementation in this district, but it is one of the things we saw during our um, conversation with our board colleagues across the country. Again, um, these are our takeaways from not just the presentations, but conversations with our colleagues nationwide. Again, our internal audit function, we found out, is first class, and we are head and shoulders above the rest. A lot of the things you don't see is because we are already doing a lot of great things, and there are people who are now copying us. And from years of sharing and working with um, the Ohio 8 Council and working through Council of Great City Schools and other task force, we've been able to do a lot of innovation and to really improve our work. President Baker, that concludes our report and our summaries on the fall conference. Thank you, Board Member Gibbs.
Any questions or comments from board members? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Brown. Uh, just briefly, um, <clears throat> this is the first time I've heard a report of this nature, and um, it's good, it's helpful. It certainly um, is, it, it demonstrates, you know, and publicly demonstrates um, why some participation and travel um, is important and that there is value. Uh, it's one of the things that uh, I know that uh, I've suggested um, in connection with uh, getting together a, a policy that uh, addresses this on an ongoing basis. And uh, it's the kind of thing that I think that, you know, if we're going to lay out, you know, uh, in April, uh, uh, over $11,000 that uh, we should uh, publicly share uh, those kinds of values. That's important, so I appreciate the report. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from board members? Th yes, Ms. Yes. Thank you, and, and thank you for that. And we've um, shared information before, and, and it's never an issue of sharing what we do. Um, the zonars that are on our current bus systems came from an OSBA conference brought back by board member Carlton Weddington. Parent University was at Council of Great City Schools that was brought back by Ramona Reyes. There's a number of um, ideas that we've implemented that we've brought back that have really benefited from us. We don't report on the um, NEA cross-site meetings, but there have been tremendous amount of work and ideas that have even come from that around collaboration um, and a lot of the work that we did in Linden came from some great ideas and strategies from there. And, and for the record, those are two of our conferences travel, but the Ohio School Board Association provides the opportunity that as long as, um, help me Treasurer Bohork, is it five people register from your district, you can send as many other people as you want for free. So as long as you pay for five registrations, we can send our her curriculum department. And that's a local, um, non-travel sort of conference. So I just still encourage all of my colleagues. I would love for all of my colleagues to find some professional development that will come back, that will aid us in our work, to help us meet the challenges of our unique work of not just Ohio, but working in an urban district in Ohio. Ohio has its own parameters, and I'm proud to work on the OSBA Board of Trustees around, you know, the work that our dear old Ohio Department of Education gives us, but also the work in the, our other two organizations for urban districts. The male recruitment, recruiting male teachers came up in all three. Um, reducing the school to prison pipeline came up in all three. Um, helping our English language learners not to feel like they're on the outside, but on the inside. And they said if the English language learners are the outside, then, pe then our students with disabilities sometimes feel like the invisibles. Making sure that we are including all of them and finding ways where other districts, and we are a, we're the largest in the state of Ohio, but when we're in the Council of Great City Schools, we're in the small to mid-range. So we're sitting with people who have 218,000 students, 329,000 students, and if they can find a way to do it, we're looking to them to say, okay, how can we implement and scale it down to do it? So it's a lot of learning, and we'd love for everyone to be able to take an opportunity wherever you do it, online, webinar, come up with a strategy so we're all learning and, and can bring something back for us to find new solutions. Thank you, Board Member Gibbs, for that report. And uh, if there's nothing further on that, um, I'd like to briefly now share uh, an end-of-year report. Um, I appreciate your indulgence. Um, December is often a time of introspection as we look inward on our work as a Board of Education and we reflect on the progress we've achieved as a district for these past 12 months <coughs> in serving the young people of this city. 
and I do appreciate your indulgence uh, as I reflect back on our year of work. From our first meeting in January and every meeting since, we've remained true to our shared vision that this district be a world-class model of public education that prepares members of our communities to reach their full potential. Together, we've strived to create an environment that supports academic achievement, continuous improvement, and lifelong learning. We governed collaboratively, responsibly, and always with integrity, demonstrating compassion, respect, and trust, and valuing community engagement and empowerment. Over these past 12 months, this body's come together for 34 meetings, both regular and special board meetings, plus another 40 or so committee meetings. We've approved more than 700 pieces of legislation, including resolutions, contracts, recognitions, and recommendations. Uh, and to be precise, it was actually 736, as counted by Ms. Tina Wilson, our board services administrative assistant. I'd like to thank her and J.C. Benton, who is our board liaison for all of the work and support they pr provided over the last 12 months. So thank you very much to both of you. Though our work touches every aspect of the district's academics and operations, there are some that stood out to me over the past year. Chief among them may be our actions to fulfill the promises made to our voters and our community as part of last year's levy. Operation Fix It. Our five-year, $125 million bond-backed initiative to target deferred maintenance needs in all of our legacy buildings across the district. It's well underway and has already produced noticeable improvements in many of our schools. On top of that, we added the first waves of new social workers, nurses, and aides to our schools to better address the social and emotional challenges that many of our students bring from home. In all, there are now more resources and more innovations in our buildings that give students in every neighborhood access to safe and supportive environments that foster all types of learning. And while the commitments and promises we made in the levy were paramount in our budget process, our representatives at the State House were not so forthcoming in support of our students. I applaud our treasurer and our district's budget and legislative teams for navigating through the state budget process. As evidenced in our fiscal year and 18, fiscal 17 and 18 budgeting, we continue to have one of the most clear, transparent, thorough, and thoughtful budget processes of any district in the state. But when the state imposed cap on the funding formula now means that our district is shortchanged as much as $100 million each year, money our students are rightfully owed, that is clearly not a partnership in education. In the months to come, I know my colleagues and I will have to have some serious discussions on how we best mitigate the state's lack of support. We look forward to engaging all of our partners in that, including CEA and OPSI and others who stand with us on behalf of our students. The state budget already had a tremendous impact on our negotiations with our two major bargaining units, but I'm appreciative, as I know you are, that we did reach collaborative agreements with both. Contract negotiations by their very nature can be difficult and confrontational as both sides champion the individual needs of their own constituencies. Together with labor leadership, we had tough yet productive conversations on a number of relevant issues ranging from the philosophical and pedagogical to the practical and pragmatic. And at the end of the day, the contracts were a good compromise for all constituencies and allow us to continue moving the district forward. Tough conversations were also needed when it comes to ensuring the safety of our students and staff. Over this past year, the board and our superintendent have not shied away from talking about the dangers faced by our young people today. While we've made measurable gains in creating safer climates in our schools, including significant increases in the staff, equipment, training, and resources we dedicate daily to safety and security in our buildings, we know that the dangers arising in the neighborhoods outside of our schools are having a very real and direct effect on the emotional and social climates in our classrooms 
and hallways. None of us can do this alone, which is why we need more community and municipal partners to help extend our safe zones and reduce incidents of violence in our surrounding neighborhoods. The time for talk really is over. We need to see action behind a collaborative strategy to reduce all violence while at the same time increasing intervention opportunities for more families. I'm sure my colleagues will stand with me as we call on others to make safety happen, not simply wait and hope. There have been too many funerals for young people in the city of Columbus. And I'd like to, at this point, um, thank some of our staff specifically who have supported this board. Um, I want to thank our treasurer, our internal auditor, uh, our superintendent, uh, deputy superintendent, all of you who regularly interact with the board along with J.C. Benton and Tina who I mentioned earlier. Um, some of you have gifts there in front of you, flowers, large flowers are not on the table because if they were we wouldn't be able to see your faces but those are just small tokens of our appreciation and those were paid for with personal funds, not district funds. So um, finally tonight, um, I'd be remiss if I, he got that look on his face. We don't have any, any big things planned, so don't, don't worry. Uh, he'd kill me if we did. Uh, but I would be, remi I would be remiss uh, if I didn't end this look back by talking about our departing superintendent. So over the past 55 months, the spirit of success in Columbus City Schools has been steadily strengthening and resonating across our schools and throughout our city and leading much of that charge has been our superintendent, Dr. Dan Good. Working with him, we've been able to empower our students and their families more than ever before. We've also worked to build community trust in our district and its operations, and we appreciate that. And as we look ahead, the sustainable, positive trajectory in Columbus City Schools will set the stage for our next stories of success in 2018 and beyond to be written as a new superintendent takes the helm of Ohio's largest school district. But in closing, I wanna to pause to personally thank you, Dr. Good, uh, for your leadership, and to honor your work with the district across our communities um, and your selfless service to students who represent the future of this city, this state, this country, and in fact, uh, this world. You've advanced our shared vision and have put this district on the path to being the world-class model of public education that we all want. And it's in the faces and stories of our more than 51,000 students that I see young people ready to reach their full potential and people of all ages. So thank you. And at this point now, I'd like to invite my colleagues to share a few brief words of appreciation. And those of you who were here before the meeting saw a video that showed on the screen. This is the same video that we showed at one of our events the other day at Fort Hayes in the Shot Tower. And so uh, what I'd like to do is give each of my colleagues the opportunity to share a few words, very few words, um, in appreciation and thanks and gratitude to the superintendent. And um, do be brief because you know he doesn't, he doesn't like to be recognized in public, um, although you do deserve to be recognized in public. Mr. Uh, Vice President, I'll call on you if you're ready to share a few brief words. I'll defer to... Board Member Hudson, you were ready to go earlier. Hudson first, yeah. Oh, it's fine. I, 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 go ahead. <laughs> um, um, I, I wanted to say it's, uh, it's, it's certainly been an, an experience working with you um, over the past four years. Um, we've had the opportunity to do some great work together. We've had the opportunity to brainstorm and to have our, 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 our deep, discussions as well. Um, discussions that I think have brought forth some of the best potential out of all of us to make this district what it is. Um, you don't get things done without having tough conversations. You don't get things done without having high expectation at stretch level and then seeking to, to do that and having the audaciousness to actually go for it. Um, I appreciate that in your leadership I appreciate the heart that you put into our staff and our children. 
Um, I appreciate uh, all of the things that we've been able to achieve together in this past four years. It's been, it's been a good ride, it has, and our district is all the better for it. So God bless you and your work moving forward, and uh, please keep in touch. Mm -hmm. All right, Board Member Hudson. Well, thank you, President Baker, and uh, um, uh, Dr. Good, I just want to thank you. Thank you uh, for your service uh, to our families and our children, our community and our district. Um, you've lifted this district on your shoulders and carried burdens that few saw and fewer truly appreciated. Uh, you've helped remediate, improve, and challenge everyone to be better leaders, servants, and students. You brought hope to many, young and old, and smiles to all. It's ironic. Oh, I'm fine, thank you. <clears throat> it, it's all right, I'll be fine. It's ironic uh, that uh, I'll quote a Boy Scout and say, the mark of a good servant leader is to leave your work site better than you found it. Dr. Good, you've certainly succeeded. You've led with grace, even under the toughest of circumstances. I've been honored to serve with you, and thank you for our time together. Wish you all the best. Thank you, Board Member Hudson. All right. Um, Board Member Preddy, at the other end of the table, why don't we go to you? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Good, you know, we're all gonna, you know, we all have all these memories and all the things that you've accomplished. And, you know, when I first got on the board, it, it was night and day of where we are now, where this, district has, where this district has come, where our community has come. We've really, really seen a complete turnaround. And, it's because of your leadership. It's because of your team. It's your team, your leadership, our teachers. But it's because of you leading them. We're doing our job, but you're the leader of this district. And you know, you've taught me a lot as an individual how to be a better board member, how to better serve my community. Things that I'll carry with me my whole life. And hopefully I'll be able to have an impact on a community as well. So thank you for that. Thank you for all those lessons. I will always, you know, hold a very special place in my heart for you for what you've done for this district. And you've left us some really hard work to do. And now we have to, uh, <laughs> the bar is high uh, for interviews. <laughs> so thank you very much, Dr. Good. Thank you, Board Member Brown. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Dan, uh, you know, I've worked and worked with and known uh, dozens of superintendents over my years of service, worked very closely with some others. Um, and uh, coming from that perspective, I, I, when I first um, watched you and, and, and came to know you and your work, uh, I was very impressed. But you know, what's important, I think, is that you've had just an incredibly positive and valuable uh, impact on our schools, on our students, on our staff, on our community, uh, impact on me as a board member, and impact on Marilyn and I both personally um, in many ways. It's, you know, the impact that you've had, uh, I think is going to last a long time here in this community and in Columbus City Schools. You've brought uh, vision, you've brought compassion, you've brought wonderful values, and importantly, for a school superintendent leadership, and, and you know, allowed people to, uh, you've brought out the best in people, and uh, given them the ability to do their jobs. Um, I'd say more than any other person, uh, you are responsible and, and get credit for the turnaround from the time you started. Uh, to uh, till, till now, and uh, and I think that you know your impact is going to continue to make a positive impact here. Uh, thank you for your service and uh, your work here, and uh, uh, thank you for everything. Ms. Gibbs. 
and I'm so sorry I'm not feeling well on your last day. Um, but when I think about you, your work, your leadership, your tenure, um, I'm reminded of the words of Wordsworth who said, the heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they while their companions slept were toiling upward through the night. And from the moment we interviewed, you have been, <laughs> you have been burning the midnight oil and toiling upwards while others could rest, while other districts did whatever they did. You kept your eye focused on Columbus City and you made sure day and night, sleepless or not, that we were always moving forward. Hasn't always been easy, hasn't always been um, fun, but you made it. <laughs> Worth the ride. Um, you did it with style. You did it with laughter. You did it with being laser focused and you did it with a sense of humor. And not everyone can look at the end of a day and say, hey, but at least this happened. And we always knew no matter what barrage of communication came, you always ended with a high point. And there's a lot of things you could think about that has happened over our time. Great things, moving our third grade guarantee points, moving so many milestones that other people may not even pay attention to, but still having the compassion to say, but we lost a student or this family member. And giving that personal touch to each and every person that you came in contact to. So you moved our focus from people and men to progress and milestones. And what we take away from your exit is a few things. One, we have to keep on moving. And you have confidence, not just in us, but in the district and the team you assembled, that the work will continue. There are people who will die and set their caskets on fire because they're gonna be buried with their torch. Not you. you. You are strong enough to say, it's time. And not everyone recognizes that. And, and you make, and you've just made us, again, grow and coalesce as a board in a way you can't do unless it's time to pick another leader. So in fact, you're helping us grow and become better people. Um, you didn't come on a red carpet. You didn't come um, on a sunny day. You came in a storm. But in a storm, the best ship is leadership. And you have guided our leadership in a way that has been tremendous. For that, I thank you and I wish you well. Thank you, and Board Member Reyes is ill at home or she would be here, but I know she sends you her very best. So the first time you and I sat down together after you started, I asked you a question. I said, how do you see the Board of Education? Do you see them as your partners or your bosses or something that else that you need to manage? And you were very honest and you said all three, and we have been. And um, so over these past 55 months, we've been through a lot together, and um, I've enjoyed most of it, let's say, so thank you for that. Um, public education is a journey, so, and I, was, I met with uh, Board Member Brown earlier today, and we were talking about the fact nobody's indispensable. Um, so superintendents come and go, board members come and go, and so some of the things that you did that will still be here after you're gone are things like building a, a great team and making sure that we have um, administrative guidelines and other things in place that, it, that go along with our policies. And so even after you're gone, even after some of us are gone, the work that we've done together will still be here in service to our students and employees and families and community members. So I thank you for that. I knew that you were committed every single day to every single student and employee and family and community member. And so even when others didn't see that, I knew you were. And every single one of those individuals is important to you. You care about them all. You want them all to be successful. I feel like you love them. Um, and I think that's been reflected in your interactions with people and, and some of the pictures I've seen of you with students, reading to students, and the fun that you were having with them. So I'll always remember that. Something else you did that was important to me is 
you kept Diet Coke in the refrigerator in your office. And so I really, I really thank you for that. I'm going to talk to Dr. Stanford about carrying that on. But it's that sort of small thing that you did just because you knew I liked it and it, it made our interactions even better because you always are thinking about others. And so um, in a position, a leadership position like yours, um, so much coming at you all the time and, and the little things that you did like that just meant a lot to me and to a lot of others as well. So I will miss you very much. And uh, our soon to be interim superintendent and has big shoes to fill, but I know he's very capable and I look forward to that. And if there's nothing else from board members, um, and we do, direct reports have a special thank you card for each of you here that we've all put our thoughts into and I'll share those with you. Um, after the meeting, before we go into executive session, after we take a big, uh, tearful group photograph. But at this point, what I'd like to do, if there are no other announcements or nothing else for the good of the order, and if all hearts and minds are relatively clear, I'd like to ask the Vice President to, uh, just before you do that, Board Member Gibbs. Yes, I'd be remiss the last minute of the year if I didn't ask for a clarification. <laughs> For the benefit of the viewing and listening audience, when is the last day of school for our students and what day do they get out for break? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm happy to let everyone know. Um, thank you for the, the question, Ms. Gibbs. Um, school will dismiss it on Friday, the, the 22nd. I want to make sure I get the dates right. Um, just to clarify, are we dismissing we dismissed early that day, one hour early, um, 30 minutes, 30 minutes early that day. Um, school will resume on the 8th of January in 2018 on the regular okay. school day. Thank you very much. So for all of our students, as we're signing off, hope you have happy holidays. Thank you. Mr. Vice President. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. It's recommended that the board recess into executive session per section 121.22 G1 Ohio Revised Code to consider the employment or compensation of public employee or officials. We have a motion before us. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Mr. Treasurer. Vice President Cole. Yes. Ms. Gibbs. Yes. Ms. Hudson. Yes. Mr. Peretti. Yes. Sir. President Baker. Yes. And Mr. Brown is absent. That motion carries. All right, and before we do adjourn into executive session, I'd like to ask everybody in the room who is an employee of Columbus City Schools to stand up so the board can recognize you. If you are an employee of Columbus City Schools, please stand up. So nothing, nothing that the district accomplishes is done without you. So thank you very much. Thanks for your dedication. Thanks for a great year. Happy New Year. Happy Holidays. The board will now recess into executive session, and we're going to take a photo right before we do that. Thank you, everyone. Happy Holidays.